Welcome to Turning Hard Times and Good Times. I'm your host, Jay Taylor. I'm speaking to you from the Borough of Queens. It is the 23rd day of August 2022. I want to thank each of you for sending along, uh, those of you who have taken the time to send along your comments about this show. We're always uh, happy to hear from you, uh, whatever you have to say about the show. It's very helpful to us. I uh, also want to thank our sponsors for uh I want to thank our sponsors for making this show economically viable. Our sponsors for today's show, Irving Resources, Novo Resources, El Oro Resources, SK Mining, Timberline Resources, and Lion One Metals. Um, I want to really uh, just talk a little bit about, before we, I get into today's show, talk a little bit about some ideas uh, from Bob Hoy, who has uh, been a guest on this show in the past, and perhaps I should get him on again. He sent me a, his latest newsletter reminding me again that gold shares perform best when the real price of gold rises. What Bob means by the real price of gold is not the price of gold in dollars, but the price of gold relative to the price of uh, materials that are used to get gold out of the ground. Bob points out that over the, the past 300 years or so, the practice of printing money to wage war leads to bubbles in stock and bond prices as well as commodity prices, while the price of gold during that time tends to remain relatively relatively stagnant. But then gold miners have a tough time making money when, you know, the cost of getting the stuff out of getting gold out of the ground um, is going up relative to the price of gold. But when you have the bust after these boom periods, what happens is that the the, um, the price of getting gold out declines, getting gold out of the ground declines, and so the margins for mining companies tends to go up. And this is uh, proven to be true over major bull markets for gold and gold mining shares. Uh, the 1930s, for example, and more recently, uh, 2008, for a couple of years right after the uh, financial crisis, we saw this happen. Well, Bob also points out that there are uh, several things that you should be lo- on the lookout for, Uh, four things, actually, that he outlines in his newsletter. One is that gold should rise relative to the price of copper, Dr. Copper, as some people call it. The gold-silver, that is, gold to silver should rise. The price of gold should go up relative to silver. And long-term interest rates should be increasing in real terms. And the senior currency, which, of course, uh, is the dollar still at this point in time, the dollar or the senior currency will get stronger relative to other uh, relative to other fiat currencies. Well, if history is prologue, it seems that we may be set right now uh, for a major turn in the gold mining share market because all of those four indicators are now in motion. But of course, time will tell. I've titled today's show um, "Waiting for Gold's Next Turn." Waiting for Gold's Next Turn. By that we mean. Um, waiting for the turn for gold to rise in price. Yes, and we're talking in relative to dollars, uh, but uh, maybe also we'll need to pay some attention to what gold does relative to uh, the commodities in general. My guests today, Brian London and John Rubino, both of them have been guests in the past, although Brian not as frequently as John. The Fed seems to be dead set on tightening monetary conditions into a recession, come hell or high water, which has never been done before. Usually the Fed loosens under these conditions, but now it's tightening because of the high rates of inflation. While gold, silver, and other tangible assets have been hit hard recently, we've seen periodic rallies in the U.S. stock market as most of today's traders who have grown up watching the Fed rescue them every time the market turns down seriously Well, these people have, like Pavlov's dog, been eager to rush back in to buy the dips after every significant sell-off. Might David Stockman be right when he opined on this show several weeks ago that there will be no pivot by the Fed anytime soon because the worst inflationary problem since the 1970s isn't going away so quickly and because David thinks the uh, masses who are mad as hell about these rising prices are going to demand that the government do something about them. And if the Fed is going to do anything, the only thing it seems to know to do is to pull back on the creation of money, at least for a little while. In other words, uh, David, though, David thinks that the Fed is going to have to keep the brakes on for a protracted period of time because the inflation problem is so severe. And, of course, it is uh, an inflation problem that is caused as much by the supply shortage as it is by uh, monetary easing, although there, 
good Lord, there's been a ton, ton of trillions and trillions of dollars that have been pumped into the system. So even if the supply isn't there, the demand is there to bid up the price on, on all manner of items. And so we're getting something close to double-digit inflation recently. Well, we'll ask Brian uh, about his views on the Fed's monetary policy, as well as other factors impacting markets, and what he is looking for in the gold markets to provide a green light that tells investors that they should back up the truck and start buying undervalued gold and silver stocks. Brian will be with me in the second half of today's show to discuss that. Last week, Alistair McLeod wrote in an article titled Geopolitics, The World is Splitting in Two. Um, he, he wrote that article, and we have to, when we go to commercial break, when we come back from commercial break, I want to ask John Rubino to, come, to opine on some of the ideas that are in Alistair's uh, letter last week. Very interesting, where Alistair points out that at this point in time, as the world is splitting into two, basically two major power structures, one being the existing NATO-US bloc, which has combined only about 19% of the world's population, that compares to 54% of the world's population that is combined in what might be considered the Russian-China bloc. The other 27% or so of the world's population are in countries that are not at this point in time aligned to either side. But clearly there are some major shifts that are taking place in the markets around the world, geopolitically, and then as a result in the markets that are destined to change our lives dramatically in the future. 